We're here to answer your gaming and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from Lamb Curry 666 who asked, what are the best games to play with older teen kids? I, this should be an interesting one. Um, leading up to tonight, I wasn't sure what our topic was going to be. So I'm like, you know what? Here's a challenge. I'm going to open up our question list. So I have a big Excel file with all the questions everyone ever sent us. And I'm like, whatever the first question on the list is, that's it. That's what we're going to do. And I planned this ahead of time. So we had time to do any research. And well, that was the top question from Lamb Curry 666, who uh, actually asked the question during one of our Twitch live streams. Uh, for those of you who aren't here live, that's at twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop, where you go live Wednesday nights. So it's during one of those shows, this question came up. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Now, why I think it's going to be really interesting is, well, we're both over 40. And we both have kids that both are teens, but not what I would consider older teens at this point. Um, some barely teenagers. And I kind of feel like we're we're sitting here and like if I had had a skateboard in the house, I would have grabbed it because I feel like I'm doing the 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 fellow kids meme from 30 Rock. Right. The, the one with Steve Buscemi and the skateboard where he's trying to fit in with the kids at high school. And in case you weren't sure we were old. Yes, we just explained a meme verbally. So please note that we aren't qualified in any way to do this other than having teenage kids of our own and knowing a lot about board games. Uh, yeah. Interestingly, we both had different takes on this question. Now, mm. Mo approached this as what games older teens want to play with each other. Yeah. Well, I was looking at what games us old folks could play and enjoy with those older teens together. Interesting. We'll get two different points of view on each of these games. Now, the one obvious thing we have to say anytime we're talking about kids, and I know we're not talking about little, little kids, but we have talked about little kids on the show, is every kid is different, even older teens and young adults. Every person is different, I probably should say at this point. Obviously, what works for one isn't going to work for another. And especially when you're talking about teens, there is a can be a huge range in maturity level between teens, even older teens. So the thing, though, that's very different here than when talking, especially, say, about preschoolers, is that teen's personal preference is going to play a big part in what games they are willing to play and what they may or may not enjoy. It's a little different with a kid where you present it to them and they either take to it or they don't. This is going to be before you even get to the table. I'm sure you're going to hear an opinion on the game before you start playing. In fact, I think this is sort of the point where kids have really developed their tastes and are going to be far more self-sufficient. Yeah. In fact, my take and the reason I answered this question the way I did is that I feel generally as an older teen, I would recommend games exactly the same as I would recommend to an adult. I, you know, at a certain point, they're just another one of our listeners and they aren't any different than our normal people. So while back in the day, we were quite limited as to what resources we had available to us. Mm -hmm. Now, the world is there for them to pick and choose from with all the reviews and content to help them choose to their tastes. Yeah, you can listen to people like us, old dudes who tell you what to play or instead of just walking into Leisure World at the mall and going, hey, that's the, from the same company as that other game I like. Now, I considered the usual thing. So the usual thing we do on a game recommendation episode is we don't just give you a list of games. It's one of the things that I feel sets us apart from some of uh, the other podcasters out there. We like to talk about, like, why we're recommending these games and and what the topic's really about. And, and in this case, I feel um, I'm not really qualified to do this. And I think it's already a little embarrassing that we're making references to memes in, te in text and, uh, and, and, and talking about them. And, and I think in this case, instead of talking about what we think teens will like, or what teens are into nowadays, I think we're just going to jump right to the games. But what we are going to do is explain why we think it'll work with older teens. Well, I'll be talking about how an adult can use this as a way to hang out and enjoy some game time with those older teens, just like Steve Buscemi. Now, these suggestions are going to be based both on what we enjoyed when we were teens and what we've seen local kids playing and talking about. Because one of the things Sean did miss is we'd have gamed with local teens at some of our public play events. We do get a wide range of players out to say our barbershop bar events and other events we've had here in Windsor in the past, as well as con games we've taken part in and so on. So we're, it's not like we're completely separated. Our, our fingers aren't that far away from the pulse here. Now get off my lawn while we give our opinions in mostly no particular order.
All right. I'm going to totally mess everything up starting right away because uh, I, if you looked at the name of this episode, I put board games for older teens. And while that's done for SEO purposes, we are a tabletop gaming podcast. And I am going to start with a tabletop game that is not a board game. And I can't help but start with Dungeons and Dragons. And that's for a number of reasons. Now, for one, that's what I was into when I was an older teen. That is we played hours and hours, multiple uh, days a week, specifically Saturdays, noon till midnight, guaranteed played role playing games. Now, yes, Dungeons and Dragons was one of those uh, back then for us. It was second edition Dungeons and Dragons advanced, sorry, advanced Dungeons and Dragons second editions. Let's get let's get the, the edition correct. But we played a ton of other pen and paper RPGs, which included Warhammer, Cyberpunk, Paranoia, Merp and many more. I, I could go on for hours just talking about the games we used to love. Now, I am calling out Dungeons & Dragons specifically, though, because of its current unprecedented popularity. And based on the local groups I see and the discords I'm part of and the Facebook groups and this and, and the meetups I get invited to, this is what a lot of at least Windsor area teens are into or trying to get into. Because I also get a lot of emails going, Mo, suppose you're the local game guy. Do you know anyone starting a D&D game? I get that once or twice a week. Now, having both gone through it ourselves, I think one of the biggest things that's important about Dungeons & Dragons or an RPG group is that an RPG group is something special. You are going to form bonds of a kind that are hard to find and form elsewhere, more so than a board game group, more so than necessarily a sports team. There is something more personal about sharing your feelings and getting into characters. Almost all of my lifelong friends are people I've sat at a table and enjoyed an RPG with. RPGs are also great for feeling part of something and being part of an active and passionate community. That's more true now than it ever has been. The online Dungeons and Dragons community is massive. And while sometimes they're arguing amongst themselves and sometimes they don't like what the parent company is doing with the game, there's still that feeling of being part of something. So this is why I put this as as the first thing up. So I'd like, like, yes, no in particular order, but this is number one. And I kept it number one. I didn't save it for last. This is my number one suggestion. If you are going to get teens into games, get them into RPGs. Now, D&D is, of course, the most well-known and the most popular right now, but there are plenty of other choices. And if you want to talk RPGs and the different varieties and what's out there, we can do that some other episode. So sitting down and running an RPG for your older teens and their friends can be a great way to interact with them using your knowledge and experience in a way that isn't competitive and can mm -hmm. help them experience a bit of that world of RPGs for themselves with the help of someone with more experience. Similarly, if you've got a developing GM, the fact that you as an adult are interested in playing through a game with them as the guide can be a huge confidence boost. Just make sure they aren't getting overly anxious at trying to please you as an adult. And I would just add to that, be prepared to back off eventually. They're probably, once you get them started, are going to form their own groups, their own group of friends, and probably aren't going to want dad or mom hanging around anymore once they get into the games. All right, my next big suggestion, um, I picked a specific game here, but also a genre, is Star Wars Imperial Assault. Because the one thing I remember having way more of when I was a teen is time. Like I said, playing 12-hour RPG sessions wasn't uncommon, nor was things like setting up a game of Talisman with all the expansions and deciding we can't finish until we played every character. Every character's died at least once, and we played over four days. It's the kind of things we did back then. That's where Star Wars Imperial Assault comes in. While each individual game is fairly short, playing through a whole campaign is going to take you quite a bit of time. You can play this one versus many. If you want that RPG feel, if you want someone to play the Empire and everyone else picking their own heroes to play, you can do that. Or nowadays, the game's been updated with an app, which lets you do a full cooperative experience so all of you can be on the same team. Now, the other reason I suggest this one in particular is because really you get two games in one. In addition to the big story-based campaign and all of the different modules and expansions you can add to that, excuse me, Modules and expansion can add to that and things like character progression and, you know, building your lightsaber as a Jedi. You also get a really solid two player skirmish war game in the same box. You can use all the characters to fight each other. 
So you're basically getting two different games in one based on if you've got, you know, a five player group of friends can play together and do the full campaign on the weekends. But then on Tuesday nights, two of you can get together and play out a couple battles. Plus, it's Star Wars. Everyone loves Star Wars, right? Like kids are still into Star Wars. Come on. A new episode of Ahsoka came out last night. People still must be into Star Wars. I don't think I'm that out of touch. Now, for people who don't love Star Wars, just in case I'm completely wrong, really what I'm recommending here is dungeon crawling games, dungeon crawling board games. My One of my favorite being Star Wars, and it has that bonus of being a skirmish game. But you could also, if you're into fantasy, check out Gloomhaven. As we always say, start with Jaws of the Lion or Descent Legends of the Dark. In the Dark, then there's many others. Now, as an adult, we know all too well that finding time for those knockdown drag out sessions can be tough. But holiday weekends and such are great opportunities when combined with enough coffee to show those kids you've still got what it takes to stay up late and game till dawn. However, you don't need to play multiple games in one sitting. I do recommend, however, when breaking this up, try as best you can to find a way to leave it set up. Having mm -hmm. to set up and tear down can really limit the opportunities to play games like this. And after too long without playing, it's easy to move on and just never go back. Very true. All right, this kind of overlaps a bit with the last suggestion. My next big suggestion for teens is to get into miniature gaming. This was my second biggest hobby as a teen after role-playing games. Besides my Warhammer campaign, I was also at home painting minis. Um, this ties, again, to having more time. And also another teen problem that I remember clearly is I'm bored. The great part about getting into miniature gaming is there's more to it than sitting down and just playing the game with your friends. It means having an entire hobby. you got a whole hobby side of things. This is great. When your friends aren't around to play, you can work, rebuild your army list. You can customize your miniatures. You can paint new minis. You can trade with the local community to get the figures you're missing. You can work on scenery. You can go and check the latest FAQ. You can go online and complain about how they nerfed that tank you just bought last week. Now, since this is a game recommended episode, I should probably recommend at least one specific miniature game. And I'm going to pull out one that I don't know if a lot of people know or not. Like I, the, the, the friend groups I have and the people I interact with do know this game, but it's not something that has dedicated stores around the world. And that is Gaslands. This is a post-apocalyptic vehicular combat game that uses standard size dinky cars, Hot Wheels, Matchbox, Majorette. I don't Here's how I'm out of touch. I don't even, I know Hot Wheels are still around because I see those. Cost-wise, all you need to do is pick up the rule book from Osprey, which you can get in PDF if you really want to save money or EPUB. You print out and cut out some templates from that PDF. You grab some six-sided dice and find some dinky cards. That's the only cost. Of all the miniature games out there, this is probably the cheapest to get into. Now, from there, you can still get into the whole hobby thing. You can get into getting custom templates. You can 3D print scenery. You can add little weapons. You can modify your cars. You can paint your Hot Wheels and so on. There is still the entire hobby aspect going on for Gaslands. And just like Google Gaslands tables and be amazed at what people have pulled off. There is a great group on Facebook I'm a member of that is constantly showing their mods. And, oh, it looks so cool. Now, that's one game. There are, of course, a ton of other miniature games out there. Um, what I would recommend if anyone's interested in Warhammer Fantasy is to pick up Underworlds, which is more of a two player skirmish board game that's card driven. And if you do dig that, then that could lead you to Age of Sigmar. There's Frostgrave, which is also from Rossprey and similar to the way Gaslands you use in any Hot Wheels. Frostgrave uses any fantasy miniatures you have. So that's good if you already have a bunch of miniatures for, say, D&D &D or whatever, so you don't have to go out and build an army. And then, of course, there's Warhammer 40,000, which was my intro to the genre way back when. Yeah, this is a huge one for people to get into, but it's also a huge amount of time. Now, if you're already a miniature gamer, introducing this gets a lot easier and painting with others can be a can be great. Of course, mm -hmm. you might have to give up some space on your painting bench and share some <laughs> paints and washes, but it means you'll have more chances to play as well. Now, if you're not already a miniature gamer, then I 100% agree that Gaslands is the way to go, especially if you haven't sold off the old Hot Wheels in a yard sale yet. Train people can also probably really get into Gaslands easily as well. The concepts in scenery translate over very nicely, even if your scale and track knowledge aren't quite as useful. 
I got to say, playing a game of Gaslands on like a well done train table could be pretty epic. And next up, I have Psycho Babble. Now, I picked this one because teams like to travel in packs and do things together. And I remember the big thing, and the, despite the number of times we say it on the show, the group should split up. I remember when it was me and my friends hanging downtown or getting together at the Windsor Gaming Society or sitting down to do anything, we wanted to do it together. We never wanted to split up and have some of us do one thing while the others did something else. We were a team. We want to stay together. So I wanted to recommend a good high player count game. Now, I also picked Psycho Babble based on how well it's gone over with my kids and some of the younger adults who come out to the barbershop bar events. Now, this is a social deduction game that's for people who don't love social deduction games. This is a great one because it does not require any lying. There's also some interesting stuff where the hidden trader doesn't know they're hidden traders. So you don't get the anxiety of having to play a special role. Now, there are lots of social deduction games out there. Werewolf, The Resistance, Secret Palpatine, blah, blah, blah. Those are all good recommendations, but I put Psycho Babble above them because you want those teen friendships to last and not having to lie to your friends is a good way to, or having to lie to your friends is a good way to break up a, 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 a friend group, whereas not having to lie to them would be a little better. Now, other social deduction games I think would work. These are all games where lying is not required at all to play are Where Words, Two Rooms and a Boom, and Deception, Murder in Hong Kong. Now, this is one where an adult can kick, kick things off and either step back and let the youngins roll on their own or try and stick with them through it. Psycho Pabble is a great one to introduce, though, as that therapist role lends itself to the teaching role mm -hmm. and allows you to help get the game flowing. Fans of the show know that neither of us are big social deduction fans. What I wouldn't recommend is trying something like Battlestar Galactica, which probably won't resonate with the younger crowd the way it will with those of us older and more familiar with the IP. Yeah, it feels strange to me that Battlestar Galactica is old again. <laughs> like, like it's, it's, it's old again. Yeah. It was already old. They brought it back. Now it's just old again and no one knows what it is. And, and that, yeah. This, this is the episode where Mo feels old <laughs> and then looks at himself in the camera with all the gray. And it's like, oh. sticking with the idea of games for bigger groups where everyone can play together. Next, I want to suggest Mr. Lovenstein presents no context. Now, this came to mind for a few reasons. Um, six player count being, of course, one of them. But really, the one that stuck out to me is that when I got this game, I didn't get it. And I was like, what, what is what is Mr. Lovenstein? I had to Google it. And while it ends up, Mr. Levenstein is a popular webcomic. And I think this is something that most older teens probably know way about, way more about than I do. But not just that. This is also one of those good, silly, laugh out loud, get people talking games. It's one of those games where you play around. And when the round ends, everyone's asking each other questions like, why did you do this? Why did you choose that? How was this connection made? What were you thinking about? And those, I think, are fantastic because those are games about making connections and learning how other people think. That makes this a great get to know you game. It's not too serious. And what I like about this one over, say, games like Personal Preference or, you know, What Would You Do? And I'm not going to name any of the adult versions of the What you Would You Do or Who. You don't it doesn't have to get personal, right? Like you don't have to explain anything. You're like, oh, I just thought the dog looked like this. Or you could go deep and explain your connection to your first puppy and really make a real connection. So that's why I recommended this one. Now, other games, I think, do that whole get to know you thing and you're talking to each other and kind of trying to explain your rationale are games like Ven, Dixit. And while I had to throw Telestrations in here, I don't know how much you'll learn from someone playing Telestrations. But honestly, it's my kid's favorite party game and it's never not been a hit with anyone of all ages. Yeah, the big benefit of this one is that the younger generation knows Mr. Lovenstein more than we do. And that familiarity yeah. of content is great for finding that a connection even across generations. You as an older folk may not know the artist, but the game concepts are familiar enough and easy to get across. While knowing the art might add some context for those who know it, it's far from required. And similarly, as someone who has, even as a adult in my 40s, played the adult games that we we aren't recommending with the next generation older it's uncomfortable mm -hmm. it's horribly mm -hmm. uncomfortable please don't do that to your younger generation yes yes either way like, like it's not comfortable on either yeah, side it's, it's just battle around 
All right. I am putting the next one on the list. Actually, the next couple. Uh, you know what? At this point, we're just going to talk about cards, I think, for the rest of the episode because <laughs> we like cards. So so the next one that came to mind for me was a card game, and then I think my brain got stuck. So I don't know if this is still true, but the, the, during Sean and I's generation, we were growing up, every single high school kid in Ontario played Euchre at lunch. Or if they didn't play Euchre at lunch, their friends did, and they were being grumpy and refused to play because they were being grumpy and teenagers and needed to be different. Traditional card games have always been extremely popular, um, not just here. I know other from what I hear down south, it's much more popular to play poker. That, that That's what they're playing in high schools. The thing is, a deck of cards and playing Euchre, Heart, Spades is great and all, but we're a board game podcast where we talk about hobby games. So I am going to throw out Thrones of Valeria, because guilds arguing at a table over drinks over who's the most powerful guild of Valeria is a much cooler theme. More importantly, though, this goes back to my high player count suggestions on you've got a bigger group, you want to stick together. This is a trick taking game to play six, but it also works when, you know, you're going out on your first date with someone and it only plays two players. It plays good at two to six players. Though it is best, I will say, at even player counts, especially at four and six playing as teams. Now, other modern trick-taking games to check out include Orem, which is a game where you can't follow suit. The Crew, which is a cooperative trick-taking game. And I'm going to pull this one out just because every time I talk about trick-taking games, someone tells me to play it and this will just save time. You should check out Skull King, and so should I. Now, this is a tough one because I think schools are more and more pushing card games out of the building uh, with some, I know banning them completely due to concerns of gambling and distractions. I suspect we may be moving towards a time when people just don't know these games unless they've been taught at home. So yeah. I encourage parents to play card games with their kids and keep them alive. This one probably relies on starting earlier though. It's quite possible that if you've gone this long without introducing cards to them, they may pass preferring other forms of entertainment. All right. As I said, we're going to stick with card games. So how about one most kids even today, I think, have played? And that is Uno. But let's retheme it to be based on the seven deadly sins with no having to keep track of score and no games that go on forever and ever. That's what you get with the deadlies. This is a hand shed hand shedding game with a seven deadly sin theme, seven players, seven suits, seven cards in each suit and a couple little bonus cards in there with special rules. This game has been a huge hit with everyone who's played played it with us, including a good number of teens at the barbershop bar. It has proved to be extremely popular. This is one where I teach a group and then they run off with my copy of the game for the rest of the night and play over and over again. And I got to say, this is something that to me would have appealed back then when I was in my late teens, though it is kind of amusing that everyone wants the lust to player token every time we start. And getting back to what Sean was mentioning about some games, it does get a little awkward because we did play a game on the weekend with a mother with her daughter at the table. And the the euphemisms that come up when you're playing <laughs> lust with someone else did feel a little awkward there. But in general, again, I was more thinking a group of teens playing with each other would be perfectly fine with all of the themes here. Now, other deck shedding games I could also see. Uh, getting for teens are the great Del Moody, one of my all time favorites uh, right now. I prefer the deadlies. I got to say great Del Moody is a good one. Um, it's kind of like an advanced version of president for those who know that game or its other name, which we won't mention. Uh, Skip Bo and one that I got the recommendation from Sean. Actually, I haven't tried it myself is Haggis. Now, as opposed to the trick takers mentioned in the previous uh, listing, many households have kept copies of skip go uh, skip Bo and uno and similar games around so this genre of card games is less likely to fall by the wayside yeah. still though it might may, may be up to the adults to show them that while skip Bo may feel a little childish there are some great games that don't have that feel that are in the same genre yeah i basically called skip joe because i hadn't played it until fairly recently uh, one thing, I just thank you, chat room, for pointing this out. I did say it's a seven-player game. It's actually a three-to-seven-player game. Seven is the max. You don't need seven people to play the deadlies. Seven is the max amount. All right, all these card games leads me to the um, most profitable card game in the world out there and something that we were obsessed with in our late teens, and that is collectible card games, specifically Magic the Gathering. 
which still to this day is is going ridiculously well. Like I, I can't believe the game had this much standing power from its humble beginnings in the nineties to the empire it is now. Thirty years now, later. Yeah. Like I, I'm I'm shocked. <laughs> like I'm shocked. And still new cards coming out, new combos and new meta and everything. And that's it. Similar to miniature painting, getting into collectible card games can very much be a hobby on its own. Now, it doesn't have to be, but most people who get into it are going to worry about collecting cards, playing the stock market that is the the buying and selling of cards, chasing the meta, which for those of you who don't play these kind of games, that's the when a new set comes out, certain combos seem to work better and try to change it. Uh, you're, the whole deck building. One of the big parts of magic is coming up with your deck, um, practicing using your deck. Uh, nowadays, a lot of that happens through Magic Arena, which is an online version. Then there's taking part in tournaments and local play events and Friday Night Magic, which is something I don't know if any local game store can survive without having Friday Night Magic, it seems like nowadays. Now, the other great thing about magic is the same thing I mentioned with Dungeons and Dragons, and that is the community that has been created around magic. You're not going to have to worry about where your kids are going on a Friday night if you get them into Magic. Now, of course, there are many other popular collectible card games out there. Uh, one of the biggest compared to Magic is Pokemon. One of the ones the local game stores tell me is the hotness. What the, the teens are playing here, other than Magic, is Flesh and Blood. And, of course, there's Disney Lorcana, if you can ever find a copy of the game to play. Now, this is something that if you're already into, it's great to share with the younger generation. But I would be hesitant to dive into it in order to connect with them. Unless you're playing purely online, this game is an investment. And the more serious you become, the more it can cost. Now, as someone personally who spent a lot of money back when there wasn't even that much to buy, I can attest to how easily one can get caught up in the need to keep up and join in the churn of cards. Mm -hmm. Playing with your family and not taking part in tournaments can certainly lessen that need to keep up with the Joneses. Yeah, actually, when my dad and I were playing Magic the Gathering together at the end there, we would just go buy two sealed starter decks and play each other, just avoiding the whole collector's aspect of the game. And yeah, sure, one deck was probably better than the other, but that is a way you can take part in the game. See, I, can you do that anymore? Because I'm not even sure that's actually an, an option. The way they well, set you it would up have now. to go to a local store to get land. For yeah. one, because like commander seems but, to be the main thing that everyone wants wants yeah. to play right now. Uh, they and do that's sell not something preset you can just... decks, though. Like you can just go buy the preset deck, and you, I go buy the other preset deck, and we can play each other. Fair. So it's kind of different. You can't go buy a random pack and right. just play each other. And I missed that. That that was to yeah, me. That, that was, was some I, of the I think fun. they still do tournaments like that. Like I think you can still do seal booster. See, we're even out of touch with magic at this point. <laughs> Because it's expensive right. and we have got better things to spend our money on. Yeah, exactly. So so sticking to that, right? So my next suggestion is the obvious evolution um, from that. Because, yes, we were obsessed with magic and and we we got into it big. We both, uh, Deanna, more so than me, spent a lot of money on it on the time. She had a better job than I could. We probably spent more than we should. So if you are worried about that collectible, keeping up, having to have the latest cards, there is an alternative. The term is coined by Fantasy Flight Games, uh, but I think everyone's using it now, is living card games. This is a, they call it living because every new expansion adds cards to the set, but you just go buy the expansion and you get all the cards. There's no rares to chase. There's no foils. There's no, you can't pay to win. Buying seven copies of the expansion doesn't make, give you any new or better cards than the person who bought one. New expansions come out regularly and they give you absolutely everything you need. Now, of all the living card games I've played right now, the recommendation I would give is Marvel Champions. Now, this is a cooperative card game, which is, again, we're trying to stick to less competitive stuff. We want the teams playing together, not against each other necessarily, because you just team friendships can last forever if you you um, take care of them, I guess. I'm, I'm the word I'm looking for. Nourish them. I don't know. Whatever. I'm going to get sappy here, so we'll stop. Uh, it's cooperative. Pick a Marvel character. Build a deck for that character. So you get that whole deck building, and every expansion adds new cards. And even if you're playing Iron Man from the base set, the latest expansion might have that one card that just makes your deck work even better. You then face off against a villain, and you draw a plot card for them, and you can play solo or a team. 
Now, while I love Marvel Champions, there are lots of other ones out there. Um, there's Lord of the Rings is extremely popular. Arkham Horror. I hear Arkham Horror is great. If you have a teen who doesn't have a lot of friends or their friends are busy or they're, they, they work night shifts so they don't have people around and they're looking for something solo to play. And of course, there's the game we love to mention on the show, the Adventuria Adventure Card Game, which probably would have been my recommendation if you could easily get the game. And don't forget about uh, Sentinels of the Universe if you happen to be the Supers fan. Yeah. Uh, if you uh, can, you tell we really like card games. Yeah. <laughs> really, there's just something so flexible and comfortable about card and card games in so many forms. I do wonder sometimes if it's something somewhat universal. Or if where and when we grew up has colored our love of cards and card games in a specific way. It's possible. And regardless of why, though, if you love cards, why wouldn't you want to pass that on and enjoy it with the next generation, especially when it's not as exp uh, competitively expensive as collectible card games can be? So there you go. Nine specific games called out that were really more calls to genres of games that I think older teens would enjoy mainly playing with each other. Now, of course, there are a ton of other options out there. Like as Sean noted at the start, the, the times like by the time a kid's an older teen, they're pretty damn sure about what they like and don't like and can pretty much make up their own minds. So in reality, the question was too vague to really get down to what games specifically we should have recommended, which is kind of why we went with genres, because my suggestion would be way more tied into what the kid's into. As we talked about on our episodes about like hooking new gamers, one of the best ways to do it is to play a game about something they're interested in. Or maybe they love jigsaw puzzles or, or solving deduction and mysteries, and they would like some like escape room style games. We know about plenty of those. or they're like kids that are all, you know, part of the chess club and they like to outplay each other and they like games with perfect information where they can intellectually challenge themselves and their opponents. And they're into super heavy euros and maybe an 18xx is the perfect game to get them into. What I tried to do is keep these recommendations tonight as broad as possible to appeal to the largest group of teens out there. Now, if you have a specific team you're shopping for, feel free to hit me up with more details. Maybe we can give you a more refined list. You can do that by emailing questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to the blog and click on Ask the Bellhop. Well, there you have it. Our list of games we think would appeal to older teen kids or that you as an adult can play with your older teens. How did we do? Did we pull it off pretending to be teens again or are we way off base? Could you do better? What games would you recommend for older teens or even better if you are an older teen into tabletop gaming? What are you into and what might you play with older gamers? Let us know in the comment below. Now, if you happen to have your own podcast and you know, you're, you're like around 18 years old, I would love to see you do a list of games to play with the old folk. 